subscribers amazingly ultimate fundraising superstar podcast talking all things fundraising charities nonprofits and more here's your host as always simon scriber Hello, how are you? Uh, good afternoon. Well, good afternoon for me. For some of you, it might be morning, uh, depending on where in the world you're watching this from. Um, we've got people watching on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Fundraising Everywhere TV, um, YouTube. I'm not sure where else, but you're all very welcome. Uh, this is a new format, um, merging the podcast, merging the news, merging a few little things I do into one thing. Um, and what we have today is I have a very special guest who's come on to talk about something which I, I just found fascinating. Um, so we're going to bring bring him on in a second. Um, but we're also going to look at some of the fundraising news that's going on today, this week, which is pretty much all COVID and coronavirus stuff. That is pretty much uh, everything in the news at the moment. Um, and then we, after this show, we are kicking off Fundraising Everywhere TV. So we have a few shows lined up for you. We've got uh, The Drunk Chef, John Lapp. Uh, we've got Kashana TV, um, and we've got some surprises coming for you as well after this. Um, but I'm going to bring my guest on right now um, because he's much more interesting than me, and I want to get talking to him. Uh, my guest today is Jonathan Cook. There he is. Hello. Hey, How are you? Hey, very well, very well. I'm not sure I'm more interesting than you. Um, uh, uh... Someone, <laughs> someone said to me, someone said before I met you, they were like, do you know Jonathan Cook? And I was like, uh, I was like, I haven't met him. And she said, he's as funny as you, but he puts things like he's much more organized. <laughs> and I was like, OK, oh, great. Thanks. Brilliant. I pulled the wall over their eyes then. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing today? Are you, you're lock, well. you're all locked up in the UK? Certainly am. Um, so, yeah, finally, people in the UK are behind closed doors. Um mm. We're, we're allowed out for our one run a day. Um, so suddenly everyone's become a runner, I guess. Um, uh, uh, my kids obviously been running around the house. So if they suddenly appear, you know, in the corner of the screen, a la that uh, uh, South Korean um, journalist uh, commentator on BBC News, maybe uh, maybe we'll go viral. Maybe we'll have uh, one of those hopefully. funny things where kids appear in the background. Who knows? Yeah. Hopefully. Well, I think I think everyone's become like really tolerant of it now. I mean, I think they always were tolerant, but now it's kind of like expected. And I think there's a little pleasure in seeing like, oh, that's what your kid looks like, or that's what your dog or cat looks like. Like we're kind of, I like this. It's like more human yeah. than the office days. Yeah, well, we, we've got their homework on, and their and their artwork on oh, on, nice. yeah, on the notice board behind me. So uh... I, I assumed you drew <laughs> you drew that. No, that's your kid. That was my masterpiece. I've I, you know forty one years yeah, yeah. of uh, of 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 trying to paint, and that's as that's as good as I can get. It's lovely. <laughs> um, so, Jonathan, you you run an agency called Insightful, is that right? Yeah. And and, and how do yeah. you how do you sum it up for those those of us who don't know it? Uh, right. So um, uh, let me kind of I'll explain it in a slightly different way. So I always said the charity sector is probably the best sector in the entire world at coming up with new ideas. So I think we're the best sector in the world at working out different ways to jump out of an airplane, you know, dress a banana, just do it in your pants, um, dress a Superman, whatever. We're, you know, we're the, we're, we're the best at coming up with new ways to run 26.2 miles as dressed as a cake, dressed as whatever it might be with one leg, whatever it might be. Um, but I think as a sector, we're not very good at testing and working out whether our ideas are wanted by our by our supporters and our audience. So I set up Insightful in 2012 to try and help organisations understand their supporters better. So that can be all about speaking to people in person, sitting down with a cup of tea and saying, why do you knit doilies or why do you bake cakes or why do you make jam? Or it's uh, at the other end of the spectrum, looking through huge, fast quantities of data, going, what do the numbers tell me? Mm. So I'm like a nerd and a kind of nosy parker. And that's what I do. <laughs> would you would you call yourself a nerd? Like a cool nerd? Or... I, 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 oh, absolutely a cool nerd. I'm definitely yeah. a nerd. Um, yeah. uh, I, look, Simon, I have a favourite spreadsheet. Okay. All right. So... 
you know, anyone that has a favorite spreadsheet by default must be a nerd. What, what's your favorite Excel function? Uh, a... Or my favorite Excel function. I, I'm a big um, concatenate fan. I love are concatenate. You? Oh, yeah. I, I, you see, I, I found an even better one. There's one called text join, which allows you to concatenate mm-hmm. like loads of cells much quicker. So text oh. join is, is like. It's, it's like the new concatenate? concatenate? It's concatenate on drugs, basically. Oh my god, you've opened my mind. I have to check this out. Um, so you're you're obviously you're big into research, you're big into data, and I suppose what we can learn yeah. from that. Um, and mm. a lot of us struggle with it because you know it's either too much or too little, and it, you know even like Google Analytics and stuff like that, we have a tendency to set up, and it's just like it's just there. We don't mm. really use it. But mm-hmm. you're you're a man who actually helps people use this stuff. Um, and the report that you and I were talking about last time I saw you um, was the report I wanted to chat to you about today. Um, The report is called why people participate in events fundraising. Um, And if anyone is watching this at fundraising everywhere.com slash TV, if you're watching this on the fundraising everywhere thing, there's a blue button underneath the blue button. If you press that, then you'll be taken to um, Jonathan's page um, where you can download this report and read it yourself. Um, Cause it's really interesting. You essentially, you looked at, hundreds of thousands of people's regular people's fundraising pages and you you analyze them you started to see what works and what doesn't work yeah so um when it comes to uh events fundraising and i'm particularly talking about online uh, giving pages here so in this report i've looked specifically at just giving pages and i'll explain why in a bit uh, in mm-hmm. a bit more detail in a second but we're actually not bad at understanding um the financial results of our of our events fundraising so how many people have uh set up fundraising pages how much do they raise how many people have, have have given uh to those people but one thing we're not very good at is looking at some of the soft information in there now this report basically came from an, a conversation that i had with a colleague of mine about about three years ago where they said wouldn't it be great if we could discover why our supporters run or do fundraising events for us now what, what if we could find out like exactly why they did it now they had about thirty thousand event participants over like about an eight nine year period so like well we can't interview mm. them all or we could yeah. do but i don't think the budget's big enough that so how can we find a way to to discover this quickly and i was like well hang on a minute every single person that takes part in a fundraising event and sets up an online giving page writes exactly why they're doing it in their personal statement so if you mm. look at anyone's um just giving page they will say i am running the you know Edinburgh Marathon because my mum has insert issue here or whatever it might be um and I was like right I wonder if there's a way of look, being able to look at all of these statements quickly and easily um and um basically I, 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 I a couple of months later after that I, I watched a tv program where they kind of explained how you can uh study huge quantities of text quickly and easily and pull out the keywords Hmm. um do you want to tell you how do you want to help yeah I, I did i actually do <laughs> because because usually we dismiss that kind of stuff because it's it's qualitative it's like you know you can't mm. break it down statistically you can't look at a summary mm. of it you have to you have to read them all so that's usually mm. how we deal with these box of texts text um but you're talking about doing something else yeah, so you're right. So blocks of text are usually ignored, if I'm really honest. I mean, you can read them <laughs> one by one. That's great. Um, but if the, if you've got 50,000, then no one bothers to read them because that's just too much to read. So this idea basically came from something that happened at the Old Bailey about seven or eight years ago. So the Old Bailey about seven or eight years ago digitized their entire um, uh, tran- all the transcripts from all of their cases since they started three, four hundred years ago um and so this is sorry what's the old bailey that's that's police isn't it yeah the the old bailey is the old bailey is like the uh the 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 largest criminal court in in britain okay okay so 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 i'm um, just asking for people who aren't as bright as me sorry on this thing uh or, the old bailey right so if you look the old bailey is like a it's like a very beautiful building in the center of london it's got a lady on top with a sword in one hand and a uh, yes. In the other. yes yes um and uh, it's the central crim- yes justice and it's a central criminal court for for it's where the, it's where the really nasty cases happen they like okay. are heard in the in, in the uk okay. um and they digitized their entire uh catalog of um of transcripts on their cases and historians justice historians around the world went bonkers they're like oh my god imagine how imagine we can what we can learn about the changing attitudes to crime through all those yeah. years 
But they had trillions and trillions of words to look through, and it's not, and it's impossible to look through that. So they used something. This is the this is the only geeky bit. I promise. Okay, they used something called word entropy. Word okay? entropy. Word entropy. You word entropy. Word right. entropy. Every single one of you knows. Yeah, every single one of you knows what word entropy is because you've all played Scrabble. Okay. 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 So you'll know that certain words mm-hmm. score different scores in Scrabble. Yeah. 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 So the word my is a two letter word doesn't score much. Yeah. The word I don't know oxidize um, telephone. Yeah. Ox- oxidize. There you go. Scores loads. Yeah. So what they did is they basically gave a score, kind of using the Scrabble scoring to every single word in this. Um, history of 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 uh transcripts of, of of court cases yeah and they went okay let's ignore all the words that didn't score highly like, we'll just completely ignore them or we'll only concentrate on those words that scored very highly and that okay. would allow them to pick out the words that are important now i'm going to give you five words from a court case and you're going to tell me what that court case is about okay. and that's and or but then he yeah, it doesn't really roll it down because men are no, the perpetrators yeah. in most of these crimes. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So all you can work out from that is there's a man involved. Okay? Yeah. But if I gave you these five words, if I said, if I said wallet, uh, kosh, blood, robbery, <laughs> death, wow. you'd be like, hang on a minute, I think yeah. someone was robbed and hit over the head, and now they're dead. Yeah. So I used exactly that technique with this so i got two hundred thousand people's just giving statements and i applied this to word entropy where i basically gave every single word a number score like you would do in scrabble yeah. and then i ignored all the little words that scored low to get rid of eyes knees how when what and i just kept those words that had uh, that scored highly which gave me the information the, the important information in people's statements there That's you clever. go have we, really clever. have we lost all our viewers now? Yeah. That was just nerdy. Yeah. People have just been watching my face just crumbling in misunderstanding. Uh, that's really I'm interesting. I'm hoping that makes sense. <laughs> no, it does. So, I mean, people set up their pages. They're talking about um, loss. They're talking about, um, yeah. you know, something that's upset them or something which is horrible or terrible. Or, you know, it's the problem yeah. solution thing is usually why we're setting up these pages. So you're trying to find the trend of of what mm-hmm. kind of words, what kind of phrases they're using on these, and then and then comparing it to how much they raise. Yeah. So um, so there's a couple of things I've done. One, I've looked at uh, the different types of um, of fundraising event they've got, and and saw. Uh, do people use different types of words for particular causes and particular events? Um, so I I, I think. Um, it's something, it's something like cycling events. I think people who take part in cycling events use more positive words than any other activity. Uh, people who fundraise for uh, for walks use the most negative language. Um, and, right, and but but when I say negative, I don't mean oh that yeah. was rubbish. I mean <laughs> I, I fucking hate walking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't mean that. I mean negative in the sense that there might be something that's sad that's happened in their life that they are, you know, it could be that they've lost someone or yeah. somebody's gone poorly or something like that. Whereas cycling is very positive. People, people are mentioning birthdays come up a lot with cycling. So oh, I yeah. think that is basically men get to 40 and go, I'm a bit fat. Mm-hmm. It's my birthday. I've had my midlife crisis. I'm going to get on a bicycle, buy some stupid Lycra. And um, I hope there's no cyclists watching. Sorry. Um, buy some lycra, look a bit daft, and try and make some money. So that's what I mean by positive words. They're mentioning things like birthdays. So, so, yeah, where, whereas if um, you're walking, it's very very often it's like these remembrance walks. It's something mm, a bit, think, you know, more accessible for people who um, yeah. maybe it's like a, a gateway drug to fundraising. So you do your easy 5K walk and, um, <laughs> maybe. and go from there, maybe. I love the idea of walk being a gateway <laughs> drug to fundraising. <laughs> but this this is cool. I mean, has anyone... I haven't heard of anyone doing a report like this before. Anyone kind of even even just giving. I mean, it's their data. Uh, I haven't heard of them really analysing it to this level. No, I don't. I don't know if they have actually. I mean, I I, I did approach them a couple of years ago and said, um, you know, is this something that's even physically possible to do? Like, can we access this these these um, these pages? And, and they very mm-hmm. kindly said, just go look at the API. So yeah. um, uh, so here's where I had to give up and hand it over to somebody else. But I didn't know how to access an API and do anything. So, but yeah. luckily my brother-in-law does. 
my brother-in-law did. So I, I, um, a couple of Christmases ago, I got him quite drunk and I said, uh, I said, right, I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to ask a favor of you. And he very kindly made me a little program, mm-hmm. which allows uh, me to effectively scrape this data off of just giving pages. Yeah. Um, which is how I was able to get 200,000. Now I don't know. The best thing is, is, is I don't know who any of these people are. Yeah. I don't, I don't know whether they, it, whether that's Jeff such and such. But I just know page number one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Did that. Um, so it's really fascinating. I've just, I'm getting a, a, a glimpse into uh, people's motivations without knowing who they are. I don't, it's really fascinating. Yeah, it's really, I was going to say creepy, but that's not the right word. It's just like, you, you're like, you, you're like a, an evil genius, you know, putting this all together. Oh. And, but you're, you're using it for good, I suppose, because the point of this report, yes, it's to, I mean, you know, to get people to pay attention to your business and what you guys do, I assume. But I know you, you're a good oh, guy. You, that, then. you want to help nonprofits out. So what do we learn from this? Because me and you, we're going to look at the report a little yeah. bit now in a second. But what, what do we learn from this? We coach our fundraisers on the language to use or we what 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 should we do, be doing differently because of this? So I, I guess if we, if we go back to that question that was posed to me, uh, you know, all those years ago, three years ago by, by one of my colleagues, what they wanted to know was or what, why they wanted to uncover this is they wanted to know how best to market their events, you know. If they discovered that all the people that took part in their pogo stickathon were doing it because it was a twenty first birthday thingy, or if they if mm. all the people that were taking part in their um, I don't know tandem cycle race were doing it because they've lost a, uh, someone, um, that's um, that they want to know that because that that then mm. influences their marketing. You know, if people are doing an event for the, for your charity because of quite sad reasons, then you probably don't want to put a picture at the front of everyone having a party going whoop whoop whoop. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah, like it's actually about presenting your audience with with something that is is, is uh, motivating, but also um, recognizes their reasons for doing it. So, for, so let me, let me go back to that that charity for a second. Um, I remember one of the things we discovered there were. Um, uh, they were a disability charity, um, but they but they help people who who, who um, predominantly they were helping people who've been born with a disability. Mm-hmm. But they didn't. But, but they also help they also help people who've been disabled in later years. And for a couple of their events, they discovered that the word brother, sister, and accident came out loads as motivation for why people were doing it. Yeah. And they suddenly real we suddenly realised that for for a particular type of event. People were doing it because maybe their brother just had a car accident and was now disabled. Mm-hmm. Now, that completely changed the way that they approached that event. They then went back to the rest of their database and said, looked at their database, well, how many people have we got in our database? Well, we've got, a rec- we've got an indication on our record that they have had, that they, they started fundraising for us because a brother or sister has had an accident. Mm-hmm. Well, we've got these 15,000 people. Well, well, we're now going to talk to these 15,000 people about this event mm-hmm. because people that take part in that event are doing it for that reason. So that's kind of the a, a, a kind of quite a practical um, uh, result of doing this. If you can understand yeah. why people are doing this, then you can market to them better. You can make your events better um, and you'll, and you'll recruit more people because it's, it's, it's what they want to do. It's like in a lot of aspects of fundraising, like if you, if you're a tiny charity and you only had one fundraiser, you'd be doing this stuff quite naturally and you'd be doing it quite well. You know, you'd be having a conversation and you'd be saying, mm-hmm. why are you fundraising and what's the event you're doing? And you'd understand them and, and quite naturally you'd change how you'd speak about it and you'd change your yeah. communications. But what you're doing here or what you're talking about here is where you get to the point you have hundreds, thousands of fundraisers. Yeah. You can't know all their stories or you can't remember all their stories. So you're talking about being yeah. Being clever about it and and almost playing the numbers game and knowing this is my typical person this is typically the motivation um so you're working with that on a on a bigger scale it's really clever yeah that's, that's completely correct as you know it, it's fabulous that, that uh, a charity can get to a stage where they've got thousands and thousands of people taking part in events mm. that's brilliant who doesn't want that but the the more information you get the less you can do with it because yeah, it's, it's impossible to go through tens of thousands of, of, of personal statements and read them all. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's almost like the well, big ones have a disav- disadvantage sometimes. They get to that point where it's the, not customer service, but like the donor love, it starts to trickle off a little bit yeah, because completely. it's hard to maintain yeah. it. And, hope, and, and hopefully this will help uh, overcome some of those issues because you're, you're right, the donor love – 
uh, there's probably a chart you could draw, you know, size of charity versus level of donor love. And it probably looks something like that. I, I think I have that chart. <laughs> I, I, I did that <laughs> chart. And it was basically, I mean, my thinking was that it's kind of goes down and up because the small yeah. charities, are, they're great at it. Like people, people who are in small charities are really good at it because they have that personal connection. And mm-hmm. have, you, have you got kids about to jump on you? Yeah, I, I've got really good wife. at spotting. Oh, is it? Okay. I've gotten really good at spotting people's <laughs> eyes when they're like, like, oh, it looks like she's just, it, well, it looks like she's going to come to get crisps for my kid. There you oh, go. Fair enough. That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as they get bigger, they lose that donor love because it just becomes unmanageable. But in theory, it should come back up again because the large charity should be investing in people like you and in, in schemes like this where they can actually be a bit smarter in their in their care is the thinking. Yeah. But I don't know if it actually. Yeah, I agree. Well, no, I, I think you're right. So one thing I've noticed is um, uh, lots of the big charities kind of have people that, like me who in, in, their, in their teams, they have, they have insight teams, they have market research teams. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and if we take, say, the top 20 charities in the UK, they've probably got a team of people that, that could technically do this. But then you've got, I don't know, 20,000 more who don't. Mm. Um, but but are of the right size that actually they're in that dip where their donor love is is going down because they've got lots of of of, of, of people taking part but they don't have the the skill to do this and um and that hopefully it's those people who benefit from this that's that's my hope that actually yeah. um they're the ones that will most benefit from discovering this kind of stuff yeah, very good. Well, I'll say it to anyone again that wants to read the report. We're going to have a quick look at it now. Um, but if you're watching at fundraisingeverywhere.com slash TV, if you're watching on the site, um, you'll see the blue button below. If you press the big blue button, it'll take you to Jonathan's uh, report. So you'll be able to see it. Um, so there it is for you. So I just want to have a look at the comments before I open this report. Um, I can see Nishan from South Africa. Hello, Nishan. Uh, Deborah in Canada. Nishin. Natasha's watching. Do you know Nishan? No, but I'm just saying hello. <laughs> oh, hello, Nish. Uh, Gillian Graham wants to know more about your favorite Excel function. Um, people are. Oh, uh, I, I'm, I could do loads if you that want. That could be a but... whole other, a whole other episode. I, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna learn any Excel function, you need to learn VLOOKUP. Okay? Yeah, VLOOKUP. Uh, oh my god, it, love it, It's a basic one, but it transforms your life. It's like once you get your head around it, it takes a while to crack yeah. it, and then once you get your head around it, it'll yeah. change everything um and i want to say Anne from ireland is watching so hello and then mo um from the unsteady hand he's talking about pivot tables which actually i never really got my head around people people rave about them but i, I, don't, oh, no. I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, no, 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 pivot, pivot tables are good <laughs> okay so some of, some of the highlights some of the things that jumped out in your report that i want to ask you about which are interesting on. so one of the things that I, it was i think it was the first thing you told me about this report as well was the killer words the words that um seem to have a really negative terrible effect mm-hmm. on your fundraising what are the one or two words that you found that are pulling it down uh so the I, the, the two biggies that stand out for me are selfie uh people that use the word selfie um generally tend to to raise considerably less money um and please spell p l z yeah. Uh, they, they are actually the two worst. They were the two worst words. Um, so what, what do I mean by the worst words? Basically, yeah. people that use those words in their just giving statements on average raise the least money. Okay. So yeah. um, in the um, uh, in in the, the the cohort that I studied, the average raise was five hundred and eighty pounds. Uh, and people that use the words please and selfie and some other ones, detox was one. Detox. Um, D D chocks D chocks yeah fuck. It, oh I'm not yeah. sponsoring anyone who's doing a D chocks no way <laughs> I can see I can um, see why that's not popular yeah they raised I think it was something like like a third of the okay. average hmm. um it was something like on average they raised like 100 it's like 190 quid or something like that versus nearly 600 pounds that's still pretty now, good isn't it like a couple hundred quid but, for d chucks I'd, I'd be happy with that well, if i was a charity yeah i think i'd be i'd be happy with that um yeah. now you know, what, what's the point in discovering what the what the worst words are I yeah mean, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that if you see um you know, somebody's written please sponsor me please plz that you should 
uh, immediately get on the phone and go, oh, please take that word off immediately because yeah, we've yeah. discovered that if you use that word, you won't raise much yeah. money. That's right. Don't do that. Some nerd. <laughs> some nerd told yeah. us. <laughs> some nerd told us. If you, don't, if you don't delete that word PLZ, we won't raise any money. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't do that. Um, but I think the point of that is it's about working out where you're going to um, – uh, put some of your fundraising effort because there are some words on the other end of the spectrum words that, that, that indicate the person is more likely to raise money um, and you know there's two schools of thought here you either my school of thought is uh, find the people that are going to raise you lots of money give them even more love and they might ra- raise you even more more money mm. um, other people's school of thought is find the people that aren't raising much money give them some love and they might raise you more money uh, mm. There's statistics yeah. in that which we can argue about another day, but but um, I guess that the point is it's about highlighting those people that are may they may need more help, yeah, uh, in their fundraising, or maybe they're just not that engaged, um, yeah. and 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 it doesn't matter how much help you give them. Um, but I just thought it was quite funny that yeah, uh, the, another one was uh, mixed martial arts. Um, it, people it's who negative people don't like it. Yeah, mixed martial arts is a negative thing. Uh, people who are who are who are who use word mixed martial arts in their um uh in their statements generally Are don't raise that much money yeah don't, well, yeah sorry don't raise much money. <laughs> you said it you said yeah. it um and and you had, you had words... you know, maybe but maybe i'm into mixed martial arts i might, I might take offense yeah. of that you know with my my massively weedy body maybe i am actually a secret ninja or something maybe we need a when all this corona stuff's finished me and you have get in the ring together for charity <gasps> We pummel each other. Uh, as two you, nerds. You've, you've, you've said it now. <laughs> as long as we don't put the word mixed martial art in our just giving statement. So uh, one one of the things that's interesting about the um, the words, you know, because it's, it's not ne- like you're saying it's not necessarily the word that is sucking it out of it, but it tells you a little bit more about the person. So maybe a, a please mm. is someone who doesn't necessarily take time on their page, doesn't necessarily put the effort. In, you know, it's, it's stuff for for you as a nonprofit to consider when you're looking at your people because some of the words that you said were were really like were on the pages that worked better were surprising and it was things like um immeasurable affectionately trajectory you know these kind of longer words which you know usually would have no place in fundraising copy um but maybe it's an indication that people are spending more time putting in like a lot of information about it putting in the story on top of the stuff around the nonprofit. Did you, mm. what? What are your thoughts about that? That there's um, beyond the word. There's well, that, there's lots about effort in here. It's and what it says about people yeah. themselves. I think you're absolutely right. You, you actually just said you said something very interesting. You said these are words that wouldn't usually find their way into fundraising copy. And you've got to remember that the people that are writing these statements aren't writing fundraising copy. Mm. They're writing a personal story. Um, and some of those words do show that they have done some research into the organization they show that the that that organization has made a real impact on their life um and like immeasurable i I, I, and i can imagine that the 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 sentence could be something like you know the care that they gave my mother is immeasurable yeah Uh, you can pick you can picture that kind of word being used um and somebody who's written that would um you know, how how invested are they in your in your mm. organization it's it's tremendous they'll be tremendously invested in your organization now that that also tells you something else if they're that measure if that if they're that um invested in you uh right now they they'll still be that invested in you in six 12 months time so you know these are the people who are standing there going hello i love your organization mm. um uh um, please have, by the way the kids are coming in now so uh, that's it's gonna be exciting. That's right. yeah well if you need to if you need <laughs> but, to abandon it i'll understand but um I no don't i don't um so you know these are the people that are waving their hands in the air saying hey look at me i love you i'm mm. you know i'm telling you that you're amazing i'm telling my friends that you're amazing mm. these are the people that if you can identify them and you can invest some time and effort in though that it won't just be events that they'll do for you they'll do other forms of fundraising they'll do they might set up regular gifts they might stick you in their will who knows mm. um but uh, yeah there are some of those words that you're, you're right it, it, the, the 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 words that raise more money it's, i never thought of it that way that actually the people have invested more time in what they're saying that's a really good way of looking at it maybe Damn, I, I should put that in the report yeah <laughs> well the the new edition because i because i get um i mean maybe 
if you're like me on social media, I get a lot of messages out in the blue from people looking for donations. Um, Cause I mentioned mm-hmm. fundraising in my profile, I'm guessing people in third world countries, people in the United States with healthcare problems and things like that message, private message me all the time out of the blue and just say, can you donate? Um, and sometimes mm-hmm. the message is like, you know, you'll get a bit invested in it because they've put time in it and they've, you know, actually written something from the heart. Mm-hmm. Whereas other times you do get messages and it's like, please selfie. And it's, and, you know, <laughs> give me money. And it's like, no, I'm yeah. not going to give you money. And it's just like, yeah. it seems like, you know, they're obviously messaging a lot of people. So they feel like I'll just throw this out and play the numbers game. But it just shows. And I think one of the things your report drove home for me is um, if you're more considerate about your ask, if you, if you, if you put some time into considering those asks, then you, you get better at it. You, if you think I about think it more. Correct. Do you want to I introduce think, I think I don't know. Rose, Rose, come on. Come be on TV. Because this is this is the this is how you have to I found with my son is you don't try and keep That's them my daughter. Picture. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Rose. Hello. Hello. Right. You can go you now. <laughs> That's sweet. This is the new world of working, isn't it? I know, and, this, and it's is, great. This is what I, we have. I mean, I, there's a lot of positives about it, you know. And once you get over the, this, the, the idea that people would frown upon your kid coming into the screen, it's like, yeah. oh, this is fun. This is nice. Um, you were talking in your report, you talk about um, senior occupations. And so when people are talking about like C, uh, CEOs, um, mm. you know, business leaders and things like that, you saw mm. a higher gift. Is that yeah, is that because no, they're mixing in rich circles, or what do you think? What's your thoughts? I mean, on that? the answer is probably yes. They probably aren't doing that. Um, but I think the reason why it's I, I put it into the report is imagine that you're you know charity X and you've got um, several thousand people take part in events for you each year, and someone has written CEO in their in their persona. You might want to take a look at that person and go, well, yeah. are they? Are they a CEO? Yeah. Are they a senior business person? Um, because before then, you didn't know that. You just knew that yeah. they were fundraising page one, two, three, four, five, and they were doing the great big pogo sticker thon dress as a banana. And now you've discovered through, through their personal statement that they happen to own, I don't know, a, 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 an IT company. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the evidence is that people with more, more, you know, uh, senior professions do raise more and and i don't there's probably no there's probably no kind of big revelation there mm. but as i said well the fact the reason i wrote it in the report was to highlight to people when you when you see that get on the phone say yeah. hello um well how can i help you in your big pogo stick thon dress a banana <laughs> i always choose really stupid yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's i mean I, you know i know i don't never really hear about people talking about prospect research or you know donor research it, using fundraising through things, events, yeah. which is their no own does. words, which is them opening up yeah. and then sharing. And actually, you know, you, this might be the first time anyone's ever said to me, you know, this is a good place to be learning about your potential donors or your potential fundraisers yeah. or your existing fundraisers. Yeah. This, think of it this way: this is the only time in any fundraising medium where the donor voluntarily tells you exactly why they're don't they're, they've run fundraising for you exactly why they're giving you money it doesn't exist in any other form of fundraising wow. um and and it's existed digitally since 2000 when just giving launched in the uk um and uh, i'm a little bit embarrassed that it's taken 20 years for anyone to go oh look there's this bit that where they tell you exactly why they're doing it <laughs> Yeah, this is that's fascinating because it is. It's like it's always been kind of dismissed as um yeah. like a text field that just, you know, we can't yeah. we can't really use this. It's just there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's mad. But it, it's potentially it is potentially the most valuable uh source of information as to yeah. why people support your charity that exists in our entire sector. Yeah. Um in your report you looked as well, or as you were looking at all the data, you were looking at types of charities you were looking at types of events was there anything really surprising for you that came through that you just were like oh i didn't expect that um yeah so um the uh, the 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 event that on average raised the most or, or or the fundraising activity that on average raised the most money um was actually people raising money in lieu of gifts at weddings mm. um uh, now that's quite timely because every wedding in the UK has just been cancelled. So um, 
so I'm not sure how relevant that is right now. Mm. But, uh, but people do get married. Um, and uh, it, people that raise money um, in lieu of gifts at, at weddings and set up an online giving page are raised like crazy sums of money compared to the average. It was, it was like thousands of pounds versus the average of about 580 pounds. Um, and I think, I'm trying to think uh, what... And you've got a report there. What? Let me just have a quick look. What was the one that raised the least? Um, um, it was me. the like celebrations. Is how I read it. So you're kind of. Um, oh uh, yes. Is that like, no, it's, yeah. that's not. It's that's not even birthdays. So it's people celebrating. Right. What, um, the MMA results. Uh, no, if, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. It, what was I, I? I mean, that's the definition that, that just giving have to an event. So I probably need to do a bit of work into what, work, working out what celebration is. But I, I yeah, thought that was they things break like into certain categories, do they? Yeah. So these are their these are their categories. So some of some yeah. are clearer than others, like cycling and marathons and runs are pretty clear. But, but celebration yeah. is maybe more, maybe more complicated. Um, uh, but it, yeah, it's it's things like uh, celebrating. I don't know, maybe birth of a child or or, yeah. um, or passing an exam or something like that or, or but there, there's a significant either. difference isn't there so if you're on a fundraising yeah. page if you're a charity on a fundraising page like just giving and you see a wedding page set up versus a celebration page set up it's mm-hmm. it's going to maybe change your priorities it's going to change how you yeah approach it and, and absolutely in fact there was even that the thing with the with the weddings is it, it you can actually drill down a bit more and uh, i discovered that people that raise money um, in lieu of gifts at weddings uh, for hospices, but adult hospices rather than children's hospices, that was the biggest fundraising thing that existed on Just Giving. Those yeah. people were raising, those people were raising like three and a half thousand pounds or something wow. on average. Um, so um, I, you and I met a couple of weeks ago at the um, hospice uh, conference, and I, I, I was, I said that I stood up in front of the crowd and and the audience said look if you've got people who you know are getting married and they've had relatives who have who have um been through the hospice and they've received good care through the hospice then ask them is it something they'd consider doing um would they consider uh setting up a fundraising page um for their wedding um because clearly people who set up fundraising pages um for their weddings for, for adult hospices are so close to that cause uh mm. that, that people you know people people want to give um now I, a couple of people came up to me after and said hadn't even considered that hadn't even thought about asking people to do that but they said mm. but actually it kind of makes it kind of makes a bit of sense imagine if you are yeah. let's say in your early 30s and you're about to get married and your mum has gone through a hospice and has passed away and you set yeah. a page for your wedding people are going to go yeah actually Done. I'll yeah. give you some money. That's a really, really worthwhile cause, um, and, and it's kind of log- lots of stuff in the report is really log- logical when you read it. You're like, yeah. oh, it's obvious. Yeah, but it, absolutely. But it, but it was, but it, it, you didn't. It's only obvious when you when it's put down in front of you. I didn't realize yeah. that, that that weddings for adult hospitals would be the biggest uh, fundraiser. But now I've done it. It seems obvious. So. It, it, it's true. It's like so much in the report. It's like it helps you get into the heads of your donor and you're like, Oh yeah. So this is probably what they're thinking. And so then we can, you know, I've always said you're a really good fundraiser. If you could read someone's mind and you're kind Mm -hmm. of tapping into this a little bit that it's like, okay, well, we know if someone's going to set this up, maybe this report, maybe if we just take time to think, okay, what's the person going through? What brought them to here? And like you said, you know, if I ever got married, there'd be an empty seat there. That's where my dad would have been. Um, and yeah. so I can imagine that if you set up, a, I mean, I'd never set up a wedding fundraiser because I need the money to pay off the wedding. But if you were to set it up, <laughs> you can see how it would work really, really well, you yeah. know, it, because yeah. you're going to draw a reference to it. And it's it's obviously such a significant thing. You're surrounded by friends and family who know that person. Yeah. So it all makes sense when you spell it out. Um, it's really mm. helpful. It's great. Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave the report. Um, I'll say to anyone again who's watching, if you go to fundraisingeverywhere.com slash TV, there's a blue button there where we've linked to uh, Jonathan's report um, and, and you can get it at Insightful. Well, you, you spell your web address funny, don't uh, you? Insight-ful.co.uk. Yeah. Co. Co. Um, or look for Jonathan Cook and he'll find you. Um, he'll send the report to you. It's he'll still, find you, that sounds good. He'll scary. find you and he'll <laughs> shove the report. <laughs> On your throat um but it's well it's well worth reading it's absolutely worth reading 
Um, before you head off, Jonathan, I was gonna. I was usually I'd look at the news as well. Um, obviously, the news all is at the moment is all around coronavirus. So I might just ask mm-hmm. you, um, how's how's it going with all this how's stuff? You're obviously in lockdown with your kids. Um, yeah. How are your clients getting on? How's the fundraising? What's happening out there? Um, there's been yeah, there's been a few clients who've expressed you know, a bit of worry about um, about their um, how it's going to fit their fundraising. I mean, every event in the UK is every fundraising event in the UK is cancelled for the next six months, basically. So, huh. yeah, not ironic. We were just talking forty minutes about events, um, and they're all, they're all cancelled, but they'll start again. Um, and you know, that's that's going to have a su- significant impact on um, on the incomes of, of of a lot of charities. There's a, there is some talk um, that the chancellor is going, the chancellor is checking the UK is is going to give some kind of financial assistance to charities it's not announced yet um but there's plenty of chatter um in kind of the, on political circles on on, on mm-hmm. social media that suggests that's something that's going to happen there's certainly been some comments out from some of the sector leaders that that, that they're looking for that i mean they're they're, they're pe- helping businesses so it, it would seem totally logical that they help the not-for-profit sector because the not-for-profit sector in the uk is what's helping um uh, or what's going to yeah. help people um, yeah. go over this? Um, More demand. Um, yeah, but it, mean, is, it is a bit weird. It is a bit weird, isn't it? You, like you talk mm. about events being cancelled, but there is a lot of events which are shifting um, uh, online. People trying to do virtual mm. stuff, and I think that's part of why yeah. I still wanted to talk to you because I think fundraising pages are, are still maybe even like more important now um, when when yeah. stuff's happening online and it seems flat. Um, this is the page that can bring it to life. And if you're using the right language and, and asking in the right way, um, we can still raise money. Completely. I mean, that's, I guess that's one of the, the, uh, the advantages of, of all fundraising pages being online now. I mean, 25 years ago, you'd have to go around with a piece of paper, get sponsors to write their names down on a piece of paper. That would just be a germ ridden rag now. So, um, you know, just because it's all online, I, it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> just like holding it up um, and ask it to the next person. Yeah. Um, uh, so now, if it's all online, that's that's you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a very efficient and easy way of doing it. Um, I think w- maybe in about two weeks or something, when when people have calmed down and 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 the new normal, um, everyone's got to come to terms with the new normal i think actually then you might see people go right i've still got a little bit of money how can i help yeah um but i th- i think there is this, there's there's gonna be a couple of weeks of, of of flux where you know for example i never i never banked on becoming a homeschooler this yeah. is this is totally new to me yeah okay um so i'm getting my head around the fact that i'm now teacher mr cook as well as you know having um the rest of my life to leave. So let's get the next two weeks over and done with. And then I just think people will settle into life as it is. And if yeah. it is, we are locked in our houses. So be it. Yeah. Um, and then I think we might see uh, fundraising pages appear where people go, right, what can I do about this? This is, this is yeah. shit. How can I, how can I help? So, yeah, I think, I think it, it is, it's the uncertainty thing, isn't it? Like if you know, everything's closed for three months or schools are closed for three months. You, we acclimatize and we, we get used to it and then we make a plan and then, yeah, people will give again. But this unknown period here that we're hopefully coming towards the end of a little bit where, you know, were things going to stay open? What was UK going to announce? What was Ireland going to announce? What was everyone going to announce? Like your, your gut instinct is just to hold on to everything, hold on to your money and just, yeah. Okay. Let's just wait and see. Completely, completely. And to be, I mean, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that in a few months' time, uh, things won't be back to normal, but we'll be getting used to the new normal. Because, mm. um, you know, if, if we're not used to the new normal in a couple of months' time, then uh, then basically we're all fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if anyone has any questions for Jonathan, feel free to uh, write them wherever you're watching. If you want to tweet them at us or put them on LinkedIn or put them in the comments box, um, do. But the other thing I wanted to ask you, this is weird because this this big news story um, broke out in the nonprofit sector. And it turns out that you actually know a little bit more than some of us about this. Um, but basically, this gent in our in sorry, in the UK, Martin Lewis. So for most people who don't know him, you know, as an Irishman, I, I kind of know of him. But he's he gives a lot of financial advice. I think he seems to be like a very TV type financial advice. The the 
Irish equivalent is called Eddie Hobbs for anyone who's watching. Eddie Hobbs. So it's like the English Eddie Hobbs. But he's he's announced on his website, he says, I'm making one million pounds available to fund urgent small charity coronavirus poverty relief. Um, and this is one of the things that's been really incredible over the last week or two is people wanting to help and some of the measures, they, the lengths they've gone to to help. Um, Martin says, we face an unprecedented challenge to our health, economy, business, personal finance and way of life. And many of those who normally help society, our charities, are going to face similar pressures right now, too. Um, so he set up this million. He's going to try and raise a bit more. He's going to start to provide grants to, to charities. And um, and as you and I talked about it, it turns out you're in the mix of this. Yeah. So um, last Wednesday at about half past 11 at night, he tweeted. Um, so sorry, I should. Martin Lewis is, is a TV personality. He's he knows everything there is to know about what bank accounts to get, how what mortgage to get, like what's the best savings account. He's a nerd, a bit like me, um, uh, just richer. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, and yeah, uh, he last Wednesday he said, "Is there anyone out there who knows anything about charities? Can you help?" And stupidly, I was still on the internet at half past eleven at night uh, on Twitter, and I went, "Yeah, I do." So anyway, yeah. he phoned me the next day, and he phoned me the next day and said, wow. "Right, um, I've put a million pounds into this fund. Can you help me distribute this money?" So basically, wow. for the last week, I've been working flat out to get applications from. Uh, various charities in the UK and some overseas actually um, that he's awarding grants up to £20,000 for direct poverty relief uh, to direct urgent poverty relief so that's things like food distribution medical distribution uh, people doing grocery shopping for people um, all that kind of uh, all that kind of stuff mm. um, now when we he and I chatted last week, he said, I don't know how many applications we'll have. We might have several hundred. You know, if yeah. we get a thousand, I'd be I'd be amazed. We've had five and a half thousand applications so far. Uh, and the closing date is uh, tonight, actually, at midnight. So if you do want to apply, get it in now. Yeah. Uh, it, there might be it might be extended depending on 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 money. Martin has actually put even more money in now. So the fund stands at three million pounds. Wow. Yeah. Um, together for and, has informed us there. It's three million. Obviously watching. There you it. go. Yeah. Um, so he got some other of his co- of his of his peers to put some money in. He yeah. put money more money in himself. But basically, we're now going through five and a half thousand applications to try and work out which ones are going to be uh, receiving some funds. Um, and the first grant to be going out this Friday. Wow. Um, and they're either they're going to they're going to any any organisation that can give direct um, immediate poverty relief help to to people in the most vulnerable communities. Um, so please, please apply if you want. If you want to, the, the application form is really short um, because we want people to be able to move quickly. Um, yeah. So it, it's short, so we can assess them quickly, and it's short, so you don't have to spend weeks and weeks and weeks working out how to, what to fill in. Um, but yeah, this, so as, as of this Friday, we'll be handing out some at uh, the first, the first batch of grants. And I'm imagining in the next two weeks, it'll it'll have all gone. We'll have, we'll have distributed all this money. Yeah, so it's, it's okay. been. Um, it's been a bonkers seven days, but um, that, that's incredible, though, because, I mean, fair play to him for doing this um, and fair play to, to yourself for putting yourself forward to do it. But the idea of turning it around that quick, because, you know, those of us who've applied for grants before, sometimes you're waiting months to hear back. Sometimes you never hear back. You know, sometimes, uh, yeah. you know, you're, you're applying for next year and you're waiting until January to mm-hmm. find out if you've got it or not. So for you to like you guys uh, or Martin to announce this, um, I mean that's less than a week that he's turned around, or you know, yeah. just over a week by the time they actually get money. But that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think some somebody could apply right now at what's this? We're at five to five to five in the afternoon in the UK right. time. Somebody could apply now and get the money in less than forty eight hours. That's what. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Where, where do they find that We will. We. Sorry, go on. I was, was going to say one thing. We we are going to write to everyone, even if even if you you haven't been successful, because um, because you know what, uh, funders that don't write to people who aren't successful, are poo. Okay, it's a horrible thing. Yeah. You put all the effort in, they don't even let you know. Right? It's so easy just to send an email saying, "I'm really sorry, you weren't successful." Okay. Yeah. So, and like, right? <laughs> it's, it's just big merge, surely. Yeah, and, and so we will be contacting everybody who has applied, whether you're successful or unsuccessful. You say that now, but polite. No, no. Like, no. No, no, it's 
No, it will do it. It's it's a polite thing to do, and it, I will make sure it's, it's it's one of my tasks to do. Um, if if you want to apply, if you go to moneysavingexpert dot com, I think yes. you go to go to the blog page, um, mm-hmm. and look at Martin Lewis's most recent blog post, and you will find um the 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 link there. But get in really quick because they are closing it to applications at midnight tonight. So that's his, that's his website, moneysavingexpert.com, dot com, isn't it? Because he's moneysavingexpert.com, dot com. Yeah. Pot noodles. He's just like constantly telling people. Well, no, he, he, he'd just tell you where he'd tell you which is the best and cheapest pot noodle to get. <laughs> okay, good. You make your own pot noodle. Find a cup on <laughs> yeah. the street. Um, <laughs> so Matt has asked, "Are you accepting bids from umbrella organisations that are asking for pots to redistribute to small charities in their net networks?" I imagine. You're only, not, but... only if you only if you can get that money out quickly that's mm. one of the one of the main criteria is can you move fast and you have can to be a registered charity okay. no you, you don't have to be a registered charity yeah. uh we are it's open to charities community interest groups even small local community organizations um okay. uh it, it, you are unlikely to get a twenty thousand pound grant if you're not a registered charity or community interest group um, company, but um, but the grants are available even to even for small grassroots organisations. Nice one, good on you. I don't want to keep you much longer because obviously you've got right. five thousand applications to get through. <laughs> um, but there's a question here um, from Noodle Flute. She was at the NAF conference that you and I were at mm-hmm. um, a couple of weeks ago or last week. Great yeah. to hear you both. Speak. Yeah. Um, but her question for you is: You said Generation X saw themselves as wanting to give more in the future. Was it Generation X? So, in your when you were speaking at NAF, were you talking about different generations and how what the trends in their giving is, or is Noodle Flute dreaming? <laughs> uh, I don't remember the exact quote I was saying there. Um, uh, it's a long time ago, isn't it? Like I know it's it only like a long time ago, or two ago. But my I, God, I remember. I remember. I remember filling my uh, presentation with pictures of dogs because I I heard some <laughs> insight that the audience loved it if it was full of pictures of dogs. Okay. Um, uh, noodle food. I tell you what. Um, uh, hunt me out. I'm Jonathan underscore M underscore Cook on Twitter, and um, we'll we'll take this offline and have a chat. Um, I think I think Generation X are um, so we're talking Generation X. I guess are people who are uh, between boomers and millennials, aren't they? They're people who um, were born. What's that from about 1965 to about well, like 19, to about 1980, I think. Because I think I'm yeah, something, something like that. I'm generation. Yeah, I am too. I'm born in 1978. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm you're, Generation you're, you're X. Yeah, what, what's, um, what's, but I think I'm on the tail end of Gen X. Um, uh, Generation X is a bit of an interesting one because um, uh, the the boomers, the, the uh, their old generation are are, are, the, are the most asset rich um, people in 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 part of the world. The millennials are the most asset poor in the entire world, um, and and the Generation X kind of sit weirdly in in the middle. Um, so they are, um, uh, and, and, and generation X, interestingly, they're getting to that point where their kids are beginning to grow up. So they're likely to have children who are between say five and about 15. Um, yeah. so generation X's kids in the next, uh, five to 10 years will have left home. Um, now, God. Uh, statistics will tell you when people when when children leave home disposable income of the household gets much bigger so um so generation x's i think will be quite a good fundraising audience when their kids are gone when their kids are gone yeah um so maybe in about 10 years they might uh, want to do stuff like that but but generation x is a weird one because they behave completely differently to millennials and completely different to, to baby boomers um yeah, and even those segments, you know, sometimes you look at like the millennials and you're like, geez, there's some range there. You know, they're, they're talking about millennials and it spans like 10 years or something. And you think of like two people, you know, I don't know. A millennial actually stands 18 years. It's anyone that was born between 1982 okay. and, 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 um, and the, the millennium, basically. So, you see, yeah, so you can have a millennial who is uh, 30, let me work this out, 36, 37, 36. And you can have a millennial who is twenty. Very good. Um, yeah. Now we now we have like yeah. the Corona generation. It's like the COVID. We have the generation. Corona generation. Yeah. There's COVID. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah. I, I did hear a lovely phrase from them, though. It was um, the generation after uh, millennials uh, are known. Well, I've heard known as the Zoomers. Hmm. I like that. And I quite liked that. Yeah, I like nice. that. The Zoomers. Yeah, I could. Yeah. I could live with that. That's good. All yeah. Right. 
I'd quite like to be a Zoomer. I think it's a good name. <laughs> yeah, um, all right, Jonathan, that's, uh, I'm not going to keep you much longer. So, so before um, we say adieu to you, where can people find you? You mentioned your Twitter, which is Jonathan underscore M underscore, underscore Cook. M underscore Cook. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's my Twitter, um, and that's, that's mainly the places where I hang out. But you can check out the website. That's insight-ful.co.uk. So that's in like insightful.co.uk, but with a hyphen in it. Um, uh, thank you. Well, insightful.co.uk, gone. <laughs> yeah, do, it's a pain in the ass. I, I used to work for a company called Face to Face Fundraising, and it was the number two. And whenever you shared your email, you'd have to be like, face two. No, the number two. No, no, the number two. No face yeah. to, and, yeah. and we got. I got a letter once to face three face fundraising. Brilliant, brilliant, amazing. So it's my name. My name is always a bit of a weird. I I always think Jonathan Cook. That's a nice, easy name. Yeah. And then someone's like, right, so that's J O H. And I'm like, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, has it got an O at the end or an A? It's got an A. Right, Cook. Has that got an E at the end or not? I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, you're kind. Of, yeah, you're kind of like it's a, It seems like a simple name, but actually, there's a lot of variants. Um, but there's you're like, Jonathan. Yeah. O H or J O N. Jonathan. J O N A T H A N and cook yeah. without an E. There you go. Yeah, well, I tagged you in, in my social media so hopefully people can find you. Um, but that's lovely, been great, John. Lovely. Thank that's you. Really interesting. And um, yeah, I'm lovely, really to, lovely to chat to you. I can't believe it's only this year that you and I finally met face to face. Yeah, I know. And now we can never see each other again. Um, <laughs> I was about to say it was the first and last time we're ever going to meet. <laughs> Um, but there you go. But listen, thanks so many for coming on. Really helpful. Um, like I said, again, to anyone that wants to get in touch with Jonathan, do, or if you're watching on Fundraising Everywhere, click the blue button and that'll take you to Jonathan's uh, report and his website. So check that out. Um, but that's it. Thanks so many, Jonathan. Thank I'm you very boot, much. I'm going to boot you out now. But um, enjoy the rest of the day and um, Mr. Yeah. Cook, enjoy teaching. Thank you very much. Take care, Jonathan. What a lovely chap, isn't he? Ah, what, a, what an adorable man. Um, but yeah, I really recommend you read that report. It's interesting and it's it's nice and simply put together that you can kind of draw your own conclusions from it. Um, but there's definitely lessons we can take from it in terms of how we're approaching uh, these fundraisers. So I'm going to I'm going to sign off myself in a second uh, and I'm going to pass this across to um, Fundraising Everywhere TV. We have the Drunk Chef coming up. First of all, we have a word from uh, one of our sponsors. Uh, they're not actually a sponsor, but Sketchnote. Um, Mandy Johnson is gonna is gonna share a little bit on her Sketchnote project, which I highly recommend you get behind. Uh, in fact, you can push the red button, whatever side it is. Blue button is for Jonathan's report. Red button is for Mandy's uh, crowdfunder. Um, so I'm gonna hand you across to Mandy in a second, and then we're gonna see the drunk chef, um, and then we have some other viewing coming up later. Um, in terms of what's coming up this week, uh, if you're into fundraising, if you're into nonprofit stuff. Um, just to let you know, I mean, the big thing that we're talking about at the moment is we have a COVID-19 um, conference, virtual conference coming up with Salesforce. Um, if you go to fundraisingeverywhere.com slash COVID-19, um, you'll see the details there. We're going to be putting up the speaker list later. Um, but we have it's a multi-track virtual event happening on April 2nd. Um, and it's going to be it, it's already going to be looks like it's going to be one of the biggest events we've ever hosted. Um, very popular. But we've got some really smart people talking about how we as a sector respond to COVID-19 and how we start to manage. Um, but yeah, so there you go. So it'll be really interesting. Uh, so go register for that. Um, but that's it for me, Simon Scriver. I will be back next week. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hand you, uh, not hand you, but I'm going to pass you over um, to Fundraising Everywhere TV. Here we go. Meet Mandy. She's a 34-year-old mother of two with a full-time job as a charity CEO. She's constantly consuming information to stay on top of the latest developments, but there's always too much to read, watch and listen to. That was me two years ago. I'm Mandy Johnson. I'm the founder of Sketchnotes UK. In 2018, I was overloaded, stressed and ended up having a mental breakdown. My breakdown forced me to reconnect with the creative side I thought I'd become too busy for. When I was younger, I loved being creative. I even studied art for a year at university. And in 2018, I rediscovered the joy that creativity and colour brings me. And I learned a method of conveying information that combines words and images. It's called sketch noting. 
since then, I've become an expert in sifting through information, pulling out the important bits and translating them in a creative way. Now my sketch notes are being shared on social media and I'm getting inquiries from companies asking me to sketch note their reports for them professionally. In a world of information overload, my sketch notes seem to be breaking through. Perhaps because our brains process pictures up to 60,000 times faster than words. And sketch notes provide the perfect hybrid of simple and engaging imagery with brief notes that provide the detail. I see an opportunity to establish a business in the UK, one that takes commissions for sketchnoted reports, consultations, conferences, blogs and much more. To do this properly, I need to purchase some specialist equipment and employ a few freelancers to help get it off the ground. That's where you come in. I'd be so grateful if you could pledge to support my business, because let's face it, don't we all want a world with more creativity and colour? Like I said, welcome back to a brand new episode of The Drunk Chef. Today I'm going to be making a pretty popular dish in this house anyways. It's a pretty easy um, chicken cutlet with cherry, tomato, panzanella. I hope you enjoy it. So ingredients, what we're going to need is we're going to need uh, onion, white vinegar, vegetable oil, extra virgin olive oil, some white sugar, a pint of cherry tomatoes, uh, some sort of country loaf, this is uh, sourdough from the grocery store, parsley, and of course, you're going to need uh, the chicken breast. And I buy the bone in and skin on because the skin is really important. So the first thing we have to do is take the bone out of that chicken. And that's probably the hardest part of this whole recipe. I don't know why I'm waving my hands because nothing's going to happen. Next, we'll take half an onion, and I'm going to use my mandolin to cut it nice and thin. Put that in a bowl. And then we're going to take our two tablespoons of white vinegar and pour that over top, and just let this marinate and pickle. Cheers. So with this next part, what we're going to do is we want to remove the bone and the cartilage out of the chicken. I'm not actually going to show you how to do that because my chef friends would actually laugh at me because of my crap technique. Um, but basically, we have to remove all the bone and all the cartilage out of the chicken. And then we're going to just pound it flat to about, um, you know, about a quarter of an inch. The other thing here I'm showing you is the sliding uh, thing. Here's a little tip for you. You take a cloth and uh, wet it down. Um, just make it nice and uh, wet. And then when you add your cutting board on top, then your thing won't slide when you're cutting. Pro tip. So I removed all the bone out of the chicken and I just put it flat on a tray and uh, we're just gonna let this uh, sit before we salt and pepper it. So we're gonna use about a third of that loaf of the sourdough and I've just cubed it up here into like three quarter inch cubes, which is just perfect. And uh, just a little last bit of prep, taking tomatoes and taking half of them and halving them and then keeping the rest whole and setting those aside for the moment. Next up, we're just gonna season our chicken and uh, with some salt and pepper. I like to use kosher salt um, usually and just sprinkle that all over on top with the salt and then with some pepper. And then we turn and we repeat the seasoning. 
Next, we uh, are going to take our cast iron pan, and uh, I'll just put it over a low heat just to get it nice and warm, maybe like three minutes, just to warm it up. And then we're going to turn the heat up to about seven or eight on the gas stove, uh, add some olive oil, and then put our bread crumbs or bread bits or bread cubes, whatever we want to call them, into the pan. We're going to basically just toast these for a while, maybe about five to seven minutes. Just keep an eye on them so they don't uh, burn too much because they will burn pretty easily. Next, while our pan's still hot, we'll add a couple more tablespoons of olive oil and then put the chicken in skin side down for about four minutes. After about four minutes or five minutes, we'll turn those over and uh, do the other side for about two minutes or three minutes till the chicken is cooked through, and then we can remove that from the pan. To that, we're going to add another couple tablespoons of olive oil, and then we'll take our tomatoes and put them in the hot pan and roast these for about, uh, about five minutes over the heat. And these are just about ready. I'm gonna add just a little bit more kosher salt, a little more seasoning, and uh, and then I'm gonna add my last tablespoon of vinegar to the pan, and then just give it a, all a little bit of a shake around. So I'm gonna take my croutons and add the tomato into that mixture. Get all the good stuff out of this pan, gotta get it in that bowl. Add my pickled onions in. Add the rest of the half tomatoes in some parsley, a couple tablespoons of parsley, sprinkle that over top. Add another tablespoon or two of really good olive oil. And then we'll mix all this together in the bowl. Mm, looks really, really good. And finally, we put the crispy chicken over top onto our salad. And that's how you do this pretty easy, pretty quick crispy chicken cutlet with cherry tomato panzanella. I hope you enjoy and we'll see you next time. Danielle Harrison from Snaresbury will wake up this morning to her 71st day of lying in a bath of cold baked beans. You can donate by calling 08459 897 233.
fundraising friends. I just finished week one, locked in my apartment with my captor. I don't know if she's listening right now. I'm just at my desk, working diligently. What am I going to do? How long is this going to last? Am I going to get Stockholm syndrome for my captor? Okay, guys, weird times. I'm on the move now. Weird times. Just trying to see where she's at. Um, I don't know. She's pretty freaky. I'm not totally sure what's going to happen. Or what she's thinking. Here she is. I'll keep you posted. She probably looks pretty chill right now, but she's mean. And she's ruthless. Send help. What's up, everyone? My name is Kishana Palmer, CEO of Kishana & Co., a boutique management and leadership learning company based in the U.S. in New York City. If this is the first time you are seeing this face, well, hello and welcome to Kishana TV. So in Kishana TV and on Kishana TV, we're going to be talking about the issues of the day. We'll be talking about the issues of the day as it relates to the public sector, to the charity sector. We're going to talk about books and parenting and pop culture news and whatever I've got on my mind. And if I'm feeling real spicy, I will bring on the Queenager. Now, you haven't met her yet, but you will in future episodes. That's my kid. She's the real star. So a little bit about me. I am a first gen American and my family is from Jamaica, West Indies. I am very, very proud uh, to be a first gen Jamaican. That's how a lot of my friends who um, are Jamaican Americans, what we call ourselves, but I'm true yardy to the bone. I have been in the public charity sector for my pretty much my entire career after a brief stint in investment banking. I love the suits, y'all, and the money that came with it, but I really wanted to do something else with my life. Why? I don't know, but I've been helping people since I was a young thing, so much so that I even won a scholarship to university for bum, ba -da -bum, bum, bum, public service. Isn't that amazing? All right. So if you want to learn more about me, please make sure you follow me on all social at Fund Diva. F 
U N D D I V A, like fundraising diva. So follow me on Twitter, on Instagram, on Periscope, Fund Diva. And if you hang out on LinkedIn the most, then you can follow me at Kashana Palmer, K I S H S H A N A P A L M E R, Kashana Palmer. And I'll make sure I get that to you again before we leave this wonderful broadcast. All right. So, first up, this week, y'all, we have been inundated with COVID 19. It is worldwide. First and foremost, if you or anyone in your family has been affected by this pandemic, my heart goes out to you. Um, I actually have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, I am on what seems to be the mend, although I have lost my complete sense of smell. Uh, my, my teenager is excited about that. That means maybe there won't be as many showers <laughs> happening around here, although she's off camera, y'all, right now giving me the only side eye. Um, what has remained for me is that I have experienced long bouts of fatigue. I'm actually taping right now in one of my up moments, which I'm really grateful for. And I did have about five days of fever with a particularly high point of about 104 during that time. But I seem to have rebounded. My lungs seem to be clear. And so if praying is your jam, just keep me in your prayers. If good thoughts are your jam, send all the good thoughts my way. If hateration is in your blood, I don't need it. Keep it. Um, but I do seem to be on the mend, however, am watching that closely. And so um, really just sending my thoughts and prayers to those who have been affected. And everything's been affected, right? Our physical health has been affected. Our mental health has been affected. I think for some of us, our spiritual health is taking a hit, right? We're like, what is happening right now? And for our organizations, you're getting all types of news right now and all types of advice. And not all of it is good, friends. Okay, so can we just talk about good advice and bad advice? All right, y'all, lean in, come on. So when you're getting good advice, you'll know that you're getting good advice, not just because of who the messenger is, but because it doesn't appeal to your sort of irrational sensibilities. We know when we're being irrational, y'all. I think we know, most of us know, some of us, half of us. We tend to know when things feel a little bit out there. My daughter sent me a, um, a, a meme that said, uh, uh, my, when your parents have gotten a PhD in COVID-19, from WhatsApp University. So here's the thing, friends. We're, we're global. Kashana TV is reaching all parts of this earth right now. If you have gotten your latest medical information from one of your family ch group chats, the probability is it's incorrect. Okay, I just want to name that. If you got a fancy infographic and in GIF that was not sent out by the WHO, the probability is some really snazzy graphic designer somewhere just kind of ad-libbed a little bit and made it up. So make sure you are checking your sources. Make sure you're checking the dates on all of your articles because some of the stuff that people have been sending my way, ask somebody who's tested positive. I really have had to question some friends and acquaintances, okay, y'all? So make sure you are fact-checking your information. And as it relates to your charity and organization, I've been hearing that we've been getting some bad advice. Like literally there are people that are saying that organizations should not be fundraising right now. Now friends, I am a recovering fundraiser. And as your comrade who is in the trenches with you for the last 17 years, and as recently as a couple of months ago, as I was in an interim role for an organization here stateside, let me tell you something. Your donors and your donor partners want to know that you have your eye on the ball, that you're clear, that you are laser focused, and that your mission is as critical today, if not more so, than it was even just a month ago. Because the social safety net, depending on where we live in the world, depending on where you're watching this video from, has shifted in seismic ways. One, because there are going to be some sort of like political gambling going on that we have demonstrated that we can do more with less. And in fact, 
because many of us have had to find a way or make one and are not actually enjoying the comforts of our 401ks and 403bs and stock holdings and family investments, et cetera. Everybody not set up that way, y'all, okay? Some of us are really feeling the pinch. And so for the missions that we are accelerating and for the missions that we feel so passionately about, it's gonna be really, really critical to help zero in and zoom in to what your constituents are feeling, experiencing, and will need, and how your donor partners can be a part of that story. That hasn't changed. Even though folks are worried about their, themselves, they're worried about their family, they're worried about their friends, and rightfully so. For the folks who were giving to your organization, for the folks who were standing in arms with you, for the folks who were coming to your events, coming to your galas, coming to your charity events, they still want to participate, but they don't have the bandwidth to figure out how. So you've got to help them see how. That's really, really critical. And so now's not the time to get onto the horseback of fear and start riding into the sunset. I don't want to hear any of that. Now is the time, if you are working with a small team, to really get creative, to look at what's out there that you can action for the long term that will allow you to be able to get some push right now. If you are thinking about working with a consultant, make sure that you ask the questions about what they understand about how to navigate in this digital space. Everybody is not an expert and everybody who talks like they're an expert is still not an expert. So make sure folks are honest with you. If you come to me to talk to me about your digital strategy, I'm going to talk to you about the last economic downturn that I experienced as head of development. I'm going to talk to you about how that looked for my organization. I'm going to talk to you how I had to learn how to run remote teams as a result and how I had to leverage technology in order to be able to be nimble if something like that were to happen again and how training is really critical and important and how my team can step in and make sure your team has that. That's what we're going to talk about. Let me tell you what Kashana's not going to make up. OK, that I have 57, 11, 245 different strategies for how to now do fundraising better digitally because I got about a dozen, but I don't have that many. And so make sure that if you decide to continue working with consultants, with consulting firms and organizations, that you're asking those hard questions. Everybody doesn't have to have the answer, but you got to make sure that you're working with folks that are going to be honest and they're going to be transparent about what they do know and what they're willing to roll up their sleeves and get in there with you and figure out. That's going to be super critical. So just make sure that you're not falling prey to the charlatans who are jumping into this digital space because they're trying to feed their families too, okay? And so let's just be really thinking about that. So mission is still first. Your donors want to know that you're there and they want to know they're still needed and they want to still get the thank yous and they want to still get the here's how you're making it possible. So make sure that you're digging in and that you are sharing that message as well. OK, so let's put the tin cups away. We're not in begging mode. We're in solve it together mode. Same as before, you and your donor family want to be able to solve big problems together. And this pandemic has put a different lens on it. Just like the lens on this video, they put a closer lens on it. And so make sure that you understand and you're adjusting your lens for what you're seeing. So I wanted to make sure that I'm naming that. If you're having um, some curiosities or you're just deluged with so much information that's out there, uh, please make sure that you look at some of the really great resources that I've been turning to. My friends over at Fundraising Everywhere is a really good one. I'm turning to my website at kashanaco.com. Um, there are some COVID uh, groups that have popped up on Facebook where consultants and other experts are giving um, lots of information and resources that they're aggregating. Um, pay attention if you're on nonprofit lists to what people are saying and what they're sharing. And, you know, try not to overwhelm yourselves with too many webinars, et cetera. W watch the ones that actually are going to help you do your job better. OK, um, try not to just watch everything because it's free, because let me tell you all something, y'all. 
free ain't always good. Okay, free 99 is not always the best, just to be clear. Sometimes you got to pay a little bit. So just make sure that you're being conscious of the resources that are out there. Um, speaking of resources that are out there, all work and no play makes Kashana really boring, like a snooze fest. So here's what has been helping me get through my days, particularly when just a couple of days ago, I was sick as a dog, y'all, okay? So if you're not on Instagram, what what's happening right now? Get Run right now, press pause on this video, run right now, go ahead and get an account, follow me, Fund Diva, F-U-N-D-D-I-V-A, but also go into your search bar and look for D-Nice, literally the letter D and then Nice. This is one of my favorite DJs and rappers of all time. Yes, I'm an 80s baby. He was like a dope rapper. Everybody remember self-destruction. You had it for self-destruction. And call me D-Nice. Look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Well, for five, for six days straight, because I was on every single day, D-Nice got on and did these epic, epic DJ sets on Instagram Live. They literally went for hours. A couple of days, they went for nine hours. Now, what job can you all do for nine whole hours straight with, with only getting water breaks and hat changes, which is what he was, uh, he was doing. It was crazy. They were write-ups in Essence, in Vibe, in Forbes Magazine. It was on Good Morning America here stateside. I know it was on some um, news channels over in um, Europe and in the UK. Everywhere, people were talking about D-Nice and his ability to take something that he is really good at and bring people together. He he didn't veer out of his lane. He didn't try to make up some new thing. He wasn't like, oh, let me go and figure out how to be a videographer now. No, no, no. He literally put the video on top of his turntable and kept it pushing. And so the lesson that I learned from him and then Biz Marquis, who, you know, you, you got what I need, but you say she's just a friend. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? I hope you know what I'm talking about. If not, Google that too, okay? Biz Marquis, just a friend. Uh, where are all my, like, come my classics in the house? My folks who love classic music, good music. So Biz Marquis was on there blending, doing all the different hits for the last couple of days. And then, friends, Quest Love from the Roots did the ill, awesome, late night. My daughter would call it the Lenny Green, the love music set. And friends, every slow jam has ever made my heart go pitter patter at any point in my very young life. Because <laughs> mama's not telling her age. Got played. It was amazing. Like totally, totally amazing. So if music is the thing that brings you back to life, like it brings me back to life, then you have got to make sure that you're plugged into Quest Love, because I'm sure he's gonna do it again to Biz Marquee, to D-Nice, to your local DJ. My favorite local DJ is DJ Kamish. Um, I love seeing him live. He has Kamish, DJ Kamish Radio. And if you follow DJ Kamish, C-O-M-M-I-S-8 on Instagram, he's actually doing lunch break and coffee break mixes now during the day. So that's just 30 minutes. At 10, I think it's at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time and I think 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. Um, for so for all of you though, all of you over in the UK, that's your afternoon and early evening. So good enough, and really just has an opportunity for you to just kind of get a good jam session. There have been house DJs that have been really amazing. You know, rock, like you name it. Music unites us. And so, what is the soundtrack for your organization right now? What are you having your team members rock out to? How are you bringing people together with music, with love, with sound? and really making sure that people are motivated through their day. So that's something like on the music front that I just had, that was my, in my, like in the news this week, because forget all the other news, that was what was in the news because that just did it for me. I was like, I have not had that much good music all at once over that many days in such a long time, if not ever. And I think that's going to change the way we experience musicians going forward because John Legend got on and did a free concert um, Anthony Hamilton got on and did a free concert. Uh, did Blink-192 get on and do that? Um, I want to say yes. The lead singer for Blink-192 got on and did that. 
Um, people are just hopping on and just doing some really great sets. JoJo got on and did that. I mean, it's just some, some really great people that are getting on and just like really um, giving it to the people so that as we stay home and as we're at home, we're still able to experience different pieces of joy. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Something that came up this week, um, I was in one of my group chats and one of the things that came up this week was that we are more aware, and I think I'm going to do a separate thing on this one, but I think this is worth dropping in Kashana TV. We are more aware of our highs and our lows right now. So if you noticed before we were at home, that you could get really caught up in the day-to-day -day of busy. I call it the hamster wheel of busy. In fact, I talk about it all the time. Look up Kashana Palmer, martyritis. Um, you'll hear me talk about, you know, working ourselves into the bone and what it means to just like want people to see that we're working ourselves to death. Well, we're all home now and no one can see anything, okay? Maybe they can see us on Zoom or WebEx or whatever, but by and large, they can't see us being busy. And so what that has revealed is that many of us rely on that visibility on people seeing me be busy in order to actually kind of like help demonstrate, you know, I'm really busy, I'm really busy. So I was in a group chat and we basically were talking about the fact that being busy now looks different because you're super aware of your good times and how you, when you're feeling good about yourself and you're like kind of hyper aware of when you're, you wake up and you're not feeling that great. Like you're not having a great day and you don't have a good reason per se to not have a good day. You just aren't. Have you noticed that friends? Like, have you noticed that you're like hyper aware of the good times, the bad times? Has any of that like kind of popped up for you? Drop it in the comments. Cause I want to know, like, are you hyper aware of your moods? Are you hyper aware of your, um, are you hyper aware of your uh, sensitivities? Like what are you actually kind of like really thinking about now that you are in the house all the time? Like I'm super curious about what that looks like for you and how um, you are engaging in that. Um, I had to get some water friends, you know, mm, I should get like a night. I need to get like a nice cup. All right. And so essentially, um, I don't know. If you... <laughs> now that I've taken a water break. <laughs> um, so that's something I, that was on my mind. I wanted to just uh, see how y'all are feeling and just kind of bring up like that was something that was really interesting about like being in the space where you're just super hyper aware of all of your sensibilities, your moods, your ups and the downs, et cetera. Um, all right. So I want to make sure that we touch on some learnings because I would not be as the CEO of a boutique learning company if I did not talk about actually learning. So we have a couple of conferences that are slated for the next few days that I'm super excited about next few weeks that I'm super excited about. First up, is AFP, the Association for Fundraising Professionals, ICON Conference, that's an international conference um, that was supposed to be taking place in Baltimore that now has moved completely virtual and are gonna have three days of really great sessions, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, and some really great speakers. Humbly, I am one of them. <laughs> um, and um, all of the sessions um, are qualifying for CFRE credit, which is really great. And so if you are thinking about uh, some additional training and additional uh, fundraising, sort of lock and tackle best practices, then ch please check out the AFP ICON virtual uh, conference and that's afpiconvirtual.com. And you can go over there and register, tell them Kashana sent you. Um, also, I'm involved in the COVID-19 uh, fundraising conference that's happening next week. And I think that's going to be hosted by Fundraising Everywhere, which is super exciting. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about team management and time management and moving to this virtual environment and what that looks like. At AFP, I'll be talking about uh, being a woman, woman of color in the fundraising profession, the highs, the lows, and what it's going to take to retain us globally. And speaking of globally, 
Um, I'm also one of the hosts for the Rooted Collaborative, which is a global community for women of color in fundraising. And if you are a woman of color or know a woman of color and you are watching this Kashana TV episode, make sure you have them go over to the Rooted collaborative.com and sign up. So we're having a free pop-up conference focused solely on personal care. And that's going to be your mental health, your, your spiritual health, your physical health, your emotional health, um, and your personal development. And we're going to be doing that starting Sunday, March 29th through Wednesday, April 1st in the evening. Y'all, we have a virtual happy hour with custom cocktails. We have karaoke, Okay, and we have some really amazing global speakers who are other women of color who are going to be talking about the issues that affect us and how we are able to stay fortified in our professions as our organizations need us. And so make sure that if you want to join that conference, you go to this bit.ly link and it's bit.ly forward slash rooted R-O-O-T-E-D-F-B. So rooted Facebook. So bit.ly rooted F-B. And sign up. It's totally free, but you've got to be a member of the Rooted Collaborative in order to uh, attend the conference. And joining us is free. So some really, really great conferences um, for your fundraising, for your personal fundraising, develop professional development, for your organization's advancement, and also for your personal development and your mental spiritual health. And so super excited about being a part of those conferences that are coming up and those education opportunities. Speaking of education, things that I'm reading this week, y'all, got to get my mind right. Okay, so I have three books that I want to share with you this week. The first is by my good friends, Ben Bisbee and Kathy Wisnowski. They have, bada bum, The Unashamed Guide to Virtual Management. So now, y'all, I love this book. First of all, I read it already, but I had to like go back through it with a fine tooth comb because I'm going to be teaching different things around virtual management. And Ben and Kathy wrote the book on it. There's lots of books out there. This one is approachable. It's hysterical. Um, I turned to it and I'm an expert in this stuff and these are my people. And so when they had to write a book about it, I said, I want in. Let me understand what's going on with this amazing book. And so it's everything from HR to office romance to bandwidth, being at home, you name it. So this is something that I'm recommending for you to read and to catch any of my sessions that I'll be hosting over the next couple of weeks around virtual team management. But Ben and Kathy did a fantastic job with this book. So make sure you run to Amazon and grab it. All right. The next book that I'm reading this week is called Story Driven. You don't need to compete when you know who you are. And this is by Bernadette Jiwa. And I um, got this book this week from a recommendation from my friend Clay. What's up, Clay, out in Vegas? And Clay is another fellow consultant, also a recovering fundraiser like me, who said, Kashana, you know, you don't have to be like anybody else, although I am not like anybody you will ever meet, friend. But understand storytelling from a different perspective and what happens when your business or when your organization is story driven. And so I think this is a really great book. I just started reading it and digging in um, really. And the reason I really like this is because everything I talk about around storytelling and around brands when I go out to give keynotes is about having a personal vision, having personal values that you can articulate and translate into your professional values, that those things are grounded in stories and that people want to know and understand and align with you around those things and that they want to be able to connect with you. And so I love that. That's a really good one that I'm digging into this week. Um, And then because, you know, I got to have all of the things, this book by Sarah Knight, Get Your Ish Together. I'm reading it again uh, because it really just talks about like the joy of mental decluttering and really making sure that you are improving on your life and that you're not um, using this time to create more busy work for yourself. I saw a lot of different uh, blog posts and different memes and gifs about what you could use this time for. And honestly, y'all, some people are using it to sleep. And that's all right, because you might need to catch up on your sleep. But some of us know that we have 1,245 open-ended projects that we've been needing to do since ever since that we need to get to. And we want to make sure that we're able to use this time. So that book kind of helped me just kind of snapped it together and kind of got my edges and really got me ready to embark on some writing projects to um, get my book published, to make sure that all the things that I have 
um, coming down the pipe are moving along. Last but not least, because y'all are like, damn, Kashana, you, did you take a breath? Heck no, okay? There were no takes in the recording of this video. The last thing is on parenting. So I am a solo mama of one fantastic teenager, and y'all, for all of my parents globally who are stuck at home with these kids, understand they don't wanna be stuck at home with you neither. Okay, what do you think I was going to tell y'all? I was going to give you some parenting tricks. I can, but maybe another episode. But it's a hilarious situation when your kids say, oh my gosh, <laughs> I want to go back to school. <laughs> it's one thing when you're home from summer break, for holiday, for a spring holiday, etc. It's another when you're forced to be in the same house as your parents. Okay, friends? It's literally not fun for them and not fun for you. Although it may seem from them running all over the place that it is fun for them. But after a time, friends, it is not as fun. So I want to say in this week's parenting moment that the thing that you can do for yourself and your kids this week is give them a project to do that does not include you. Okay. It is not going to be right. It may not turn out right. It may be half done. It may be all the things. But really, this is a good opportunity with basic supervision to give your young people and to give your children some opportunity to start developing some autonomy if they don't have it already. And so that could be anything from finally mastering three different breakfasts that they can make themselves at their height, okay? Or it could be finally mastering the art of fancy ramen. It can be anything that allows them to start to be more self-sufficient and get some out of your hair. Okay, I love these kids. We know that they are wonderful humans that we bring them bring into this world and we have to shepherd them to adulthood. But this time is going to test our parenting skills and abilities. And half the time we're going to want to pull our hair out. But we are not their friends, friends. We're the parents. And so make sure that you are keeping that in mind when the activities are low and the stress is high and the walls seem to be closing in. Helping them to be self-sufficient is going to be one of the keys to making sure that you get space and time for yourself. You've got this. You've got this. You've got this. Okay. I'll be back next week with another episode of Kashana TV. I hope you got something from the myriad of things that I talked about in this week's episode. I look forward to hanging with y'all real soon. If you want me to talk about particular topics, make sure you drop it in the comments. Let us know how we can serve you better and what I can bring for you. And I'll be back with more of life, of charity, of fundraising, of parenting, music, books, you name it. I'm Kashana Palmer. Make sure you follow me across social at Fundiva, F-U-N-D-D-I-V-A. Go to my website, kashanaco.com, and I will talk to you real soon. <laughs>
the first lab, I was going to make one rule, and the rule was you're not allowed to talk about Parkinson's at the lab. It's like Fight Club, you know, know, the Fight Club rule. Um, But I was so nervous and so excited. The first lab, I totally forgot to make the rule um, and tell anybody. So we did the lab, and for two hours, nobody talked about Parkinson's. It was the best thing in the world. Had I made the rule, it would have been phony and fake, and we would have had to think about it. But we did make the rule. I didn't make the rule, and it just happened. And for like a year and a half, I think we – there, there's a little chit chat about Parkinson's coming in, a little chit chat on the way out. But for those two hours, we really were focused on something else, right? I mean, I am. I don't know. Because the, the creativity, we don't want to say art, but your creativity allows your brain to clear itself from Parkinson's. Yeah. Which is just a godsend because Parkinson's just wants to take over your brain. So for two hours, we can enjoy ourselves. Yeah. Without worrying about, did I draw this wrong or did I do this wrong or did it's not right? There's no rules. It's all right. <laughs> right. Happy little accidents. Happy little accidents. <laughs> um, what's your favorite media? Like, what do you? What's your favorite thing to do? Like, so far we've done a lot. We've done we've done tons and tons of things. What's your favorite? Top two, top three. Um, well, I've been getting into colored pencils. That's something I hadn't done for a while. Right. I'm enjoying that. And watercolor is something I really couldn't deal with, but I'm starting to get into that. Yeah. And uh, I actually, been doing some chalk pictures. Right. Some uh, pastels. I, I did mine with sidewalk chalk. Right, right, right. You told me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I uh, covered it with hairspray when I was done. Right. And you'll see there's a hot air balloon I drew. Yeah. And that was outlined in, in uh, sidewalk chalk. But I'm going to try some pastels too and see what they how they work. Yeah, cool. Um, and uh, I guess another thing, one of the things that we kind of hope as an organization, personally, I hope is that the institute has an impact beyond the two hour labs. You know, beyond those two hours we spend once a month together, has there been an impact that you feel like creativity or the labs or just being a part of our group has helped beyond th- those two hours in your life, or is it just those two hours or your escape? And no, that's... the two hour the two hour escape shows you that you can do more than what you think you can do. Yeah, and the paintings that are, and the artwork that I do at home, I spend two, three, four days a week sometimes doing art at home. Yeah, but I'm also a ham radio operator, and it's allowed me to able to get back into my ham radio and getting it set up and enjoying that so i think it frees your mind of all the clutter long enough to be able to do something yeah that's cool yeah um and i think another point kind of back to the peak art surprise real quickly um that the funds that they gave us um that people in general give us as donors organizations give us um one of the things we're doing now is a lending box um where we have a box of art supplies pastels um watercolors, paper, you name it, that people can take home during the month that we're off um, to do stuff like Lonnie's doing at home. Because I don't want, we as an organization don't want people doing art two hours a month. We want people to do an art, like Lonnie said, four or five times a day. And, a that's, and that's a great thing, too, because a lot of people might not be able to afford the paints and the right. papers and things. And right. intimidation of wanting to do it but can't afford it makes it great for somebody to be able to have the opportunity to not only not worry about paying for it, but the ability to try it at home where they're not being washed, and if they have to throw it in the trash can, right. they throw it in the trash can and start it again. Right, right. Like, for example, Lonnie has a nice new set of charcoals and pencils and stuff that the Institute hands letting him borrow, uh, that he's going to experiment with charcoal and uh, graphite for the first time. And that's just kind of, that's important to us. And that's the kind of things that your your funds support, which is important to us. You know? uh, it's, and the other fun thing is we use the good stuff. We don't use the cheap Walmart stuff. We use the stuff that's high pigment, pops off the paper, and kind of guarantees success, right? When you use good art materials and yeah. nice paper, you're like guaranteed. It just happens, right? And it, it happens. You just let it happen. Yeah. But another thing that's, that I've enjoyed doing with in Steady Hand, this sounds kind of corny, but yeah. on Facebook, I've been having fun doing birthday fundraisers and right. different kinds of fundraisers just because I want to get the word out there. I want people to understand how much this means to somebody with Parkinson's to have the ability to not only do something, but feel good about what they're doing and not have to pay for what they're doing. Yeah. Our programming is free. So anybody who wants to join us, please join us. Uh, And uh, that's paid. The Parkinson's foundation actually uh, pays everybody's studio fee. Uh, We used to have a studio fee. We got a grant from the Parkinson's foundation and they amazingly pay our studio fees for us. That's cool. Uh, So that's about all I got. Do you have any other things you want to like, just sort of like, 
creativity thoughts or Parkinson's thoughts that you want to share before we wrap up? It just it well, doesn't have to you, be about anything in particular. If you have Parkinson's or you don't have Parkinson's, come to the unsteady hand, especially if you don't have Parkinson's, come and see how that steady hand helps us and, and impacts us while we're there. See the lightness that people have and just don't let Parkinson's take you over. Just do it one day at a time. Yeah, drawing outside the lines, right? Yep. Yeah. Reimagining Parkinson's, that's what you are trying to do here. So. I want to thank Lonnie for spending some time with us today and opening up his house to us and letting me sit in Sue's chair on top of three pillows so I'm not 12 inches shorter than him. Um, and that's about all we have for today. You can visit us um, at the at theunsteadyhand.org. Uh, you can email me at mo, M-O, at theunsteadyhand.org. And we also have a fairly significant Facebook presence. Um, we're trying to post about art and creativity and Parkinson's and sometimes the combination of the two. So uh, on that note, I think we'll wrap up. Once again, a big shout out to the Picards Prize uh, for last year. Vote for this year, please. Uh, there's three great organizations looking to get a grant this year that could certainly have an impact on other people in other communities. So with that, we'll say goodbye. We'll sign goodbye. off. Um, nice to have you come by, Mo. <laughs> it's nice to be here. And uh, we will sign off with uh, the idea of um, how about embracing the tremor. Embracing the tremor. Yeah. All right. So on that note, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> We're live. And breaking news at HSD GA5, we have our pet of the day. Now here's Karen Washington with Randy. Thank you, Susan Delaware. This is Randy. He is our breaking news pet of the day. And you know why? He's a 13 out of 10 good boy. Just look at that little face. He also has a wiggle butt. Randy, show him that wiggle. I guess he's a little camera shy today, but we'll cut to him wiggling his butt somewhere else. Sit. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. And this has been your breaking news pet of the day. Back to you, Susan Delaware. Thank you, Karen Washington, for that breaking news update. Randy is a 13 out of 10 good boy. Randy is available for adoption at the Humane Society of Northeast Georgia Adoption Center, which is open Tuesday through Sunday, 12 to 6. This is Susan Delaware with HSNEGA5 Breaking News. Hope you have a tail wagging good day. enjoy an intermission. You'll find our snack bar chock full of good things to eat and drink. Tasty, tempting hot dogs, thirst-quenching soft drinks, fresh, crunchy popcorn, a complete assortment of delicious candy, and a full line of cigarettes. You've plenty of time, so visit the snack bar now. A tasty treat will double your enjoyment of the show. For your convenience, we shall keep you informed of the remaining intermission time. Three minutes before the next show starts. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. The next show will start in two minutes.
Yes, toddy, the chocolate malt in a can. It's so good hot. It's so good cold. It hits the spot with young and old. Yes, toddy pleases everybody. Delicious chocolate malted toddy made with rich, real milk, not powdered milk. So come and get it, everybody. It's time to drink your chocolate toddy. Just a minute, folks. Yes, that's all it takes to visit our refreshment counter in the lobby. There you'll find popcorn and an assortment of popular candy bars to please every taste. Try one of these delicious candy bars. Big Time, Butternut, Milkshake, Payday. Topped with Hollywood's super rich coating of the kind you like best. They taste wonderful. They're delicious. They're nutritious. Get one at our confection counter in the lobby now. The next show will start in one minute. Hello, folks. Uh, hope everyone is uh, is well in these strange times. Um, Jess has asked me to make a little film just to talk about the whole issue of working from home. And uh, I think probably because I it's something I've been doing for around about six years now. Um, that in no way makes me any kind of an expert on what we're all going through at the moment. So I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about things that I'm doing at the moment. Um, and also uh, drawing on the fact that we've been homeschooling the kids for about a week now because the schools in here in the Netherlands uh, shut down about a week ago. So I, I just hope some of this is useful. So I, I've got around about six or seven points to go through quite quickly. So the, the first one is um, get outside, um, get outside of the house and ideally try and get out early in the day. Um, we, we've got a dog, so one thing we do is we all take the dog out for a walk together first thing in the morning. Um, that gives you a number of advantages. First of all, it means that you uh, you get dressed. Uh, you get dressed, you get out of the house, and coming back to the house is sort of coming to work. Um, you, you get that exercise, and if you have got kids at home, it's a good chance to talk to them about how they're feeling and pick up on any worries or whatever that they've got. Um, Second thing is make sure your workstation is comfortable. Uh, Jess has got loads of other information for you about your workstation. Please, please take that seriously, especially where you're sitting, because that can totally knack you if you get that wrong. Um, and uh, you're going to be doing all kinds of phone meetings and so on. Uh, don't expect perfection. You're going to do phone calls where your partner walks past behind you wearing their pants or whatever. Uh, those things are going to happen everyone's going to be working from home. So don't expect that sort of perfection the whole time. Um, third thing is think about social time. Uh, you, you're going to be quite isolated. You're going to be, um, you know, seeing your family, flatmates, whatever you've got, you're going to be seeing them all the time. Um, but make opportunities to connect with your friends, with your workmates. Um, I've been doing virtual coffees with people and, and only today I've connected with um, three people in Ireland, in Canada, in India, who I haven't spoken to in ages. So uh, do those little virtual coffee meetings and and have kind of connected downtime. Um, next thing, I think this is the, the fourth point after going outside workstation social. Fourth thing is about your headspace. Um, really looking after your sort of mental well-being. I, um, I use the Headspace meditation app. Um, if you think that stuff is a bunch of hippie shit, then just give it a try and see how it goes for you. Um, it, it really can help just to kind of give you literal, literal headspace. 
Um, fifth point I'd say is is have realistic realistic expectations of yourself and how productive you're going to be. Um, you'll have sometimes when you are not very productive because you've got all kinds of domestic distractions, worries about your kids, about your parents, whatever else. That's understandable. Give, give yourself a break. Um, but you'll have times when you are very, very productive. I sometimes find working at home uh, when you are not in the interruption culture that you have at work, that you, you do get vast amounts of stuff done. Um, six point, really, for, for those of you with kids, and I realise there are no general points to be made about having kids at home because because um, you've all got kids of different ages and, and many much younger than mine. My, mine are 10, 12 and 14. Um, so, so with kids, I would just say try and negotiate and agree a new set of ground rules um, and, and then stick to them because just like grown-ups kids need to know the rules they need to know the, the parameters that they're working to um, if you're doing homeschooling I honestly don't think you need more than about two and a half hours a day of of concentrated homeschooling is is probably more than you will need um, final point point number seven I would say really is um, the most important thing you will do in the next little while is, is to ask for help when you need it. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help, even if you're not sure what help you need. So uh, I'm sure your teammates will be there. All of your DTV colleagues will be there. If you think I can help, give me a shout. But just um, be prepared to shout up and to uh, ask for help, as I say, even when you're not sure whether you really need it. Um, that's all I've got to say to, for now. I, I hope it's just some kind of help. Um, take care of yourselves. Be well. Bye bye. about love that it should come from above and it should come from below she used to say my love were the lips of a saint and the hips of a whore and when we'd walk along the street she'd say if it rains now I hope to God it pours with her beautiful ideas, yeah, she'd cut me in half, clean as a broadsword. Now I, I just can't seem to get out of bed anymore, yeah. And now my, my heart hangs warm and weak like an old wire door, yeah. And now I... I just can't seem to get out of bed anymore. She used to say that magic was the edge. And science and God, they were the size of a cup of penny piece. Yeah, and it's far better to keep it spinning and spinning and spinning than for one side to fall and to freeze. Oh, when we'd walk along the pier, well, she'd point at the waves and say under there, that's where we go when we're asleep. You know what, she let us slip, that I was the best of the beautiful ideas. Now I, I just can't seem to get out of bed anymore, yeah. And I, 
now man My heart hangs warm and weak Like you know I adore ya Now I I just can't seem to get out of bed Let's get naked and get under the sheets. Let's get naked and get under the sheets. Let's get naked and get under the sheets. She said, Let's get naked and get under the sheets. Let's get naked and get under the sheets. She said, Let's get naked and get under the sheets. Yeah, let's get naked and get under the sheets. And now I, I just can't seem to get out of My name is Jonathan Andrews from Remarkable Partnerships. The world is changing around us. The coronavirus is providing us with a new reality. If you're a corporate partnerships lead at a charity, you're probably wondering how to respond. We suggest the question you ask yourself is this, how can we pivot our partnership offer in response to this uncertain time? After all, the need for corporate involvement in our causes has never been greater and partnerships are more vital than ever. So here are our six recommendations to respond to the coronavirus from a corporate partnerships point of view. Number one, focus on shared purpose. In times of uncertainty and fear, it is companies with purpose doing meaningful work that will stand out. So when you engage your corporate partners or prospects, it's really vital that you articulate your shared purpose with them. This is the powerful why that will inspire them to partner with you and do brave work that gets noticed. Recommendation number two, link your cause with coronavirus. So how is your cause affected by the coronavirus? Does this represent a greater challenge for the people who need your help? Deafblind UK, for example, know that people who are deafblind already feel isolated and lonely. There's over, over 400,000 of them across the UK. So imagine how they must feel when they hear instructions such as, you need to self-isolate, you need to stay at home, you cannot meet up with your friends. Deafblind UK, are taking this message to their partnerships and their prospects right now. Recommendation number three, strengthen your proposition. Coronavirus means that we all have much more time on our hands right now. So as a corporate partnerships lead, what you want to do is use this time to really articulate your partnership offer in a much more compelling way. We suggest that you organize a virtual meeting with your colleagues to identify the compelling problems that your charity has, which companies could help you solve. Once you've got this information, you can then really hone your proposition until it sends shivers down your spine. If it doesn't send shivers down your spine, then you need to go further, sharpen it more until it has such incredible cut through that you get really excited and inspired by it. 
Recommendation number four, shift your activity. Traditionally, so much of our activity has happened in physical spaces, happened uh, face to face. But we live in the digital age now. We live in challenging times right now. So how can you make your partnership activity that you offer to prospects and partners virtual? With so many people working from home, we need to engage employees and consumers digitally. So, for example, you could suggest digital campaigns in partnership with companies or suggest online cause marketing promotions or um, simple employee fundraising activities that um, colleagues can do from their home. Recommendation number five, and we believe this is our most important one. So be part of their survival plan. Right now, companies across the UK are having emergency meetings on how it is that they can survive and ride out this terrible circumstance that has hit us um, in the UK and across the world. So you need to really meet that need. You need to meet their survival need. So how is your partnership activity that you're proposing to your prospects or partners going to help them sell more, reach more, or keep colleagues motivated and um, uh, feeling engaged with the company whilst they're working from home? So what you want to do is make your partnership part of their survival plan. Recommendation number six, prospect virtually. Engage your corporate prospects by phone, email and social media. Um, and it, you can have uh, prospect meetings via Skype, Zoom or Teams. It's totally possible to engage the prospect online if your message is powerful, simple and based on shared purpose. And in fact, we've just done this with Changing Faces where we met with a prospect last um, week and it was a brilliant meeting. And that prospect has definitely come on board to work with us in the future. So those are our six of my recommendations. We hope they um, have been useful and they give you confidence and a suggested way forward. And I'd like to finish you with a quote from the inspirational uh, woman, Helen Keller, who was um, deaf blind herself. And she said, a bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. I'll repeat that again. A bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. So it's down to us to make the turn. Thanks very much. You've been listening to Simon Scriber's Amazingly Ultimate Fundraising Superstar Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and head over to changefundraising.com. What's up, fundraisers? This is Simon Scriver. And this is Nikki Bell, and we are the founders of the virtual fundraising conference, Fundraising Everywhere. And we have just launched Fundraising Everywhere membership. So if you want full access to the virtual conference every November, if you want full access to the Fundraising Everywhere festival in May, if you want bonus downloads, if you want access to extra sessions, if you want access to VIP events, if you want access to all of my masterclasses online, if you want pizza for losers discount, if you want all of this stuff and loads more... And a whole bunch of other stuff, which we can't even cram into this tiny podcast ad. But if you want part of that, then go to fundraisingeverywhere.com, become a member, be part of the family, pay a small monthly membership fee to us, and you'll get all of this stuff.